Hi, this is Kelly Hoffman, Director of Capture Management for Equus Workforce Solutions. I'm live at the Forum in Washington, D.C. Today I'm going to be talking with Matt Waltz, Vice President of Partnerships for Kale. Hi, Matt. Hi, Kelly. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, this is great. Happy to be here. Why don't you start by telling me a little bit about your role and a little bit about Kale? Sure. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Uh, so like you said, my name is Matt Waltz. I'm the Vice President of Partnerships for Kale, which is the Council for Adult and experiential learning. Uh, in the partnerships team, I, I lead our, what we would normally say is our sales team, but we're a nonprofit organization. We're all about collaboration and partnership. So it's our, it's our partnership team. Uh, Kale is an organization that's been around for about 50 years now. Wow. Uh, primarily focused on workforce development and post-secondary and focusing on adult learners. Great. Um, and what are some of the things you're seeing in terms of partnerships between higher education and workforce development um, and kind of thinking beyond just referrals to training programs? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting time that we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, high inflation, uh, unemployment is at record lows. Mm -hmm. uh, every business that we talk to says they can't find workers, yet individuals don't seem to know how to navigate the workforce system. Uh, and we're also seeing enrollment in post-secondary organizations being at an all-time low. And uh, a thought that there maybe isn't value in, in post-secondary, especially with the high cost of tuition. So we're, we're, Kale is trying to bridge these, all of these challenges that currently exist, that individuals don't want this job that is paying a subpar wage, they want a career, they want something that has good pay, benefits, something that they can do and enjoy that they, their, their work, uh, and yet, there seems to be just a disconnect between each of those organizations. So some of the things that are really interesting is, is how are we bringing all of these entities together? How are we having the employers at the table to say, this is what we need. This is a, the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need from workers. And how do we have the workforce boards and their training organizations and ultimately post-secondary institutions provide that training, which may ultimately not be a degree Many, uh, micro credentials, short term training, uh, and then ultimately working out career pathways and a map so that while somebody, you know, we, we hear all the millennials that want to start as the, the president of the company, <laughs> we all know that's not realistic, but also people don't want to start a job that they don't know what their next steps are. So being able to map out all of the career moves, the training that's needed and where they receive that so that they can start here and ladder up into those positions. We're seeing a lot more connections in that. Okay. Yeah, it seems like there's, I and mean, we've all talked about career pathways all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and we can all describe what a career pathway is, but it's kind of the devil's in the details in terms of the implementation of that. You know, a lot yes. of people might be able to see a career pathway on paper, but are you seeing employers be flexible or more supportive in terms of like earn and learn models or, you know, start accessing training um, and professional development while at work so they can really can continue to move up a career pathway? Yeah, we're, we're really seeing that. Uh, most employers are really trying to fill those entry level positions. But if they can show that you have to start at that entry level position to be able to ladder up into those higher level positions, those positions become more attractive. Uh, individuals want an organization that really supports their career growth. So employers that have training programs instituted inside that organization are more appealing. We're also seeing a lot of attraction in apprenticeship. We're seeing more, uh, you know, there's a lot of apprenticeship funding through the Department of Labor. We're seeing a lot more focus on that. And I would say non-traditional apprenticeship. So everybody always thinks of skilled trades, but we're seeing a lot more financial services, um, you know, ad advanced manufacturing, which might include robotics, um, healthcare, uh, professional occupations that really are non-traditional in an apprenticeship space, but the model works. An earn while you learn model that the employer is investing in your career pathway just makes sense. And we're seeing a lot more of that. That's great. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, Tell me about credit for prior learning or prior learning assessment. What is the difference? Is there a difference? Sure. And how does that idea fit into supporting adult learners' economic mobility and career goals? Yeah, great, great question, Kelly. 
So, right, the, the two word terms are often interchangeable. So credit for prior learning, uh, assessing, pri prior, assessing prior learning. So what we're seeing is that there's a trend that nationally credit for prior learning is the overarching word or terms that's being used, whereas the prior learning assessment is what the individual institution often uses to assess somebody's learning or past prior experience to give them credit. So while the two are combined, credit for prior learning is really the theme that everybody is going with. Uh, and, and this is something that Kale has been known for for almost 50 years, that credit for prior learning is just so important nowadays because again, individuals, especially adult learners, somebody that wants to go back and get a degree or get credentials and they might be in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they have a career or they have a job, they have you know, sometimes children or other life uh, experiences. We wanna be able to give them credit for all the things that they have done in their life. And by being able to give them a little bit of a leg up so that they're not starting as a brand new student with no credits, they're gonna come in with nine, 12, maybe a few more credits. They're gonna feel a little more accomplished for the things that they've done in their life. Ultimately, they'll complete that degree if that's what they're trying to do sooner. Uh, they also have less financial burden because they're not paying for the entire program. So all in all, it works very well. And again, it's recognizing those individuals for their life experiences. Uh, we, we've seen some, some really creative areas where organizations are able to give credit for prior learning. Veterans is a great example. Everybody comes out of the armed forces with all these acronyms that nobody can really understand, mm -hmm. but they're all micro-credentials in themselves. So how does an institution give them credit for the things that they have done? Uh, we've also seen individuals that maybe think fast food isn't a great start for, for a career. Some of the McDonald's and other organizations that have really good training programs, most secondary institutions recognize that and can actually provide them credit for that, that experience that they have. Uh, we've seen individuals that can come and show that they know how to weld, even though they've maybe never been through a formal training, can receive credit for that. Uh, we've even seen individuals that have ran daycare facilities. And you start to say, well, wait a minute, they know operations management, they know HR, they know all of these skills. And many post-secondary institutions will say, well, we can give them credit for some of that. So it, it's a great way to get somebody's foot in the door and not have to start out with a, a brand new, big education that they have to have in front of them. Yeah, I think it, I mean, it makes so much sense when you think about adult learners and the amount of time they have to kind of get that ROI on right. an educational investment. If you make that, you know, faster, shorter, easier, more clear, mm -hmm. um, they're going to see that return a lot faster in terms of increased earnings. Right, right. right. And I'm happy to hear that there's, it seems like there's so much more creativity and flexibility than there used to be. There, there really is more creativity. We're seeing on state levels, we're seeing much more coming from the state where they're requiring their institutions to implement credit for prior learning assessments and actually have systems in place that normally would not have been required. So systemic change from a different perspective is really a good thing. Uh, we're also just seeing, again, as institutions have lower enrollment, they're being flexible because what they may not have traditionally viewed as their target audience with these adult learners, they're suddenly realizing, wait a minute, this is a, an audience that actually does often want education, they just don't know where to start. Yeah, and what's Kale's role in the whole prior learning assessment world? Sure, yeah, so, so again, Kale has been doing this for, for years and years. We really set the model for credit for prior learning. So we do a lot with post-secondary institutions reviewing their curriculum, reviewing their enrollment process, working with their instructor to say, are your classes accommodating for a non-traditional, uh, an adult student? Uh, what, what can be changed? What can be done better? How do you market to maybe a different demographic than you had traditionally done? We also have a great software product. It's called Credit Predictor Pro. Oh. And an institution can actually use the software that allows an individual to upload their resume and it will look at all of their prior training, which is often non-credit, their job experience, and it will align to show where they can actually have credit at that institution. So it makes it easier for them to you know, just upload this resume and, and look at maybe a few institutions and say, 
I can go here and have this much credit. I can go here and have this much credit. I, you know, looking at different programs that are available at those different institutions. Uh, it really gives an opportunity for them to, to just get a leg up and, and really be recognized as an adult learner. Yeah, it seems like it's um, the translation is what's so important. You're translating life experience, volunteer yes. work, previous work experience, and then how do you translate that to um, to credit that counts towards a credential? Right, and, um, and, and what we're doing now with the workforce boards that often work with non-traditional, non-credit training agencies, you know, a lot of community-based organizations, we're starting to say, okay, how do we work with those organizations to show that what they're providing can actually provide credit so that an individual can, again, be on a career pathway and that does connect to post-secondary, but may not start at a traditional institution. Mm -hmm. So my last question is with the um, new influx availability of more flexible, unrestricted federal funds like mm -hmm. ARPA, mm -hmm. are you seeing any interesting proposals or partnerships across higher ed and workforce development? Yeah, we, we really are. We're seeing as post-secondary institutions are realizing the disconnect, their enrollments are down, employers are saying they can't find workers. Those institutions, those employers, those employer associations, hail where we can are coming together and saying, let's be creative, let's make something new. There's some new apprenticeship funding that's, that's out right now. Same thing, we're designing new apprenticeships that did not previously exist in occupations and sectors that had not traditionally looked at apprenticeships. So all the stimulus dollars that are available, all the Department of Labor funding, Department of Commerce funding, it's a great opportunity to be creative and come up with new systems and programs that did not previously exist. So if I'm a workforce board and I'm hearing from my local employers, we are really struggling to fill this type of job. Can we think about an apprenticeship? I should call you. Yes, definitely. Give me a call. <laughs> We'd love to help them out, design some new curriculum, design some new programs, help bring all the pieces together. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of this busy conference to chat yes. with me this afternoon. It has been a pleasure. This is great. Thanks again for having me. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to another conversation at Live at the Forum. Please continue to follow along and watch the other great interviews.